Welcome everyone. This is, we're going to be talking about selling, enterprise selling specifically. If you are in the back of the room, you're certainly welcome to listen in. We are going to be doing exercises at the end as well. So you might want to sit next to someone or find a partner throughout this presentation. All right, let's go ahead and get going. Today, we're going to talk about enterprise selling. Specifically, I'm going to walk you through a very basic process. I'm going to start off with some basic preliminary work. This is stuff you do, and I'm going to curse a little bit for those on the far side or those on the live stream. So I'm going to, this is shit you do before you call a customer okay. or a potential customer. This is stuff you prepare for. You don't just pick up the phone and dial people. It doesn't work. The next thing we're going to do is how to talk to a customer, how to investigate, ask questions, interact with them so that you can gain information and be much more successful at selling. That's the second part to that. That's the investigation portion. After you have done that, then you demo your product. You'll notice where that is, a little bit later in the process than most people do it. Yes, we'll get to why in a few minutes, but it is, in fact, late in the process. You do not start by picking up the phone, calling someone unprepared, and saying, hey, let me show you my product. Not very effective. Lastly. After you have done this, you've done the investigation, you know what their benefits are, you've done your demonstration, that's when you move to the end part, closing or commitment. I want to be slightly careful on this statement. Sometimes commitment is not money. Sometimes you're negotiating deals, biz devs and exchanges, so it's not always money, it's commitment, not necessarily financial, all right? Any quick questions before I get going? Like, why are you here? Why am I here? All right, let's get rolling then. So I'm going to start off with the first, the first step, which is preliminary. The first thing I want you to understand is this is designed for larger deals. If you're doing 5K deals, this is probably not the right method for you. It's designed for larger deals. It doesn't mean it won't work at all. It means that it's too expensive a process. You're going to do some work. It's going to take some time. It takes the salesperson. At some point, it, it's simply too heavy a hand, right? I'm going to use an analogy, basically, if you're going to put a nail in, you don't want a sledgehammer. You want the right hammer. This is but one tool among many for sales. I'm specifically, though, today, I'm just going to be talking about larger deals. Okay? Lastly, there are exceptions to this in large deal, and occasionally people bring it up. I'll cover them all the way at the end of this. There are some cases where this won't work for very large deals. Very quick. Yeah, really good question. Do you mean 10K, like... So for the moment, it's, it's the check you're going to get. If you get an annual check up front, or if they're committing for a year, or if it's at least a very high retention. But it's got to be worth it for that sales guy. If you're paying a sales guy to make a phone call, and he's expected to close a 2K deal, it's, it's not going to work out real well for you. All right? All right, let's keep going. So the second thing I want everybody to understand, one of the biggest differences, and I put this up front in preliminary, because you're selling to a group, not a person. All right? He goes to the store, he wants to buy a pack of gum. Does he check with all of his friends that it's okay to buy a pack of gum? No, that's silly, right? It's, it's a pack of gum. How many of you are married? You're going out to buy a house. How many of you don't talk to your spouses about it? <laughs> Those people who are about to get a divorce, please raise your hand. <laughs> when you sell to big companies, it's a group. You got the guy from purchasing, you got the guy from legal, you've got the person who's going to get the benefit from it. You've got the admin who prevents you from getting to the right person. It is a group. So the first thing to understand in this is you are not selling to a person. There are different people. Each person has a vested interest in the process. When we go through this process, we need to recognize that different people are going to be done differently. I'm going to give an example just so we go through it. You get on the phone and it's the administrative assistant to the VP you're trying to sell. How many people are going to try to sell that person? Going to go ahead, hey, here's what our features do, here's what our product does. How many people would try that with that, with that admin? Right? Probably not, right? It's, it seems pretty obvious to you that's really not her job. OK, there you go, you're group selling. Congratulations, you're experts already. That's the same idea, though, applies to other people. So I'm going to go through some of the main ones, gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are normally people who have low power in an organization. They use something called lording. Lording is when you use the power of someone you report to or someone around you in order to prevent and or basically prevent, in this case, prevent the sale from moving forward. They're gatekeepers. Okay? We'll talk more about how to sell them in detail, but first recognize that there are people like this as part of it. 
Your job with a gatekeeper is to get by them, obviously. But I'm going to offer you a piece of advice, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes. Being an asshole does not get you good brownie points. It does not help you. Oftentimes, people that are lording, what you want them to do is feel a little bit important and, and be pleasant. Lastly, some of these same people, gatekeepers, will become insiders for you. They will pass you information. So, oftentimes pleasant, professional, give them credit for power perhaps they don't have in order to get past them. This is an example of a gatekeeper. There are several others we're going to talk about. I'm going to cover them briefly, and then at the end of this, we're going to cover them in more detail. Buyer is sometimes different than decision maker. Buyer can be in purchasing. Decision maker might be the guy in the business unit that gets the benefit. You need to know the difference. The purchasing, all he cares about is the price and making sure his organization shows a victory. Completely different than the decision maker who might be in a functional organization who wants the benefit of your software or product. Therefore, you're going to sell them differently when we move forward in this sales process. Lastly, I want to be, bring up a specific note on something called a champion. Anybody know champions? Anybody dealt with this idea of champion, getting a champion? Or how many people raise your hand? OK. I'm going to ask an interesting question for you. How many people have closed a large deal without a champion? Where do all the hands go? Exactly. Champions are one of the most critical things you need to develop in this process. Someone on the inside who feeds you information, who supports you, who drives it forward. Your goal is to give that guy a big fucking cannon to take your, to take your stuff forward with. He's the one who's going to end up doing a lot of work for you. He's the one that's going to pass you insider information. What that means is your job in many cases is to equip the champions with the necessary tools to sell. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes as well. So, we start off by talking about when this is appropriate. We're talking now about the fact that there's groups involved and so different people. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about politics very briefly. They exist. We, humans, we are emotional beings. We think we're logical. Really, we think we are. We're not. Neither are your buyers. The fact is almost all decisions get made on an emotional level. People first decide they're going to do something. Then they look for facts to support it. You know what? VCs are like this too. <laughs> we are, you need to acknowledge that. Don't be a fool. I don't care what your ROI is. It will fail if you don't address things like politics and personalities. Be aware of it. Stop fighting about trying to win the math. Win the hearts. Make them passionate. The math will somehow magically work out. Okay. So pay attention to politics, pay attention to power plays and things like that. We'll talk again more later in this discussion on it. And lastly, PR, economic disasters. If you're selling a piece of software that is critical to the business, they function based on it, you should understand that you're also selling risk aversion as much as you are selling benefits. They don't want to be fired. They don't want a disaster. This is, their, this is very risky. Therefore, as part of the process, you must address the risk involved with a negative outcome. Making that go away is one of the best ways to move a deal forward with that stuff. In many cases, they get stuck for risk, not benefit. Okay? So first, acknowledge that, pay attention to it, and we'll talk more about that as we move through the process. Okay? Lastly, I'm going to talk about this idea of managing the group. I cannot tell you how many sales guys I know that send a CC to everybody in the group for every email. They do a lot. You need to think about managing the group. Right? Who's the right person to send this to? Who needs to be included? If somebody is lording, if the lawyer is lording, basically means that he's trying to control the process, you might have to extra CC him. Yes, manage the group. I'll give you an interesting hint. It's very much like managing people. If those of you who are managers and are managing people, you know you have to pay attention to people's feelings and how they think. Same thing with when you do large deals. Okay. We'll talk about certain cases where that's not true, but for now, that's, that's a general idea. All right. So now, you're set. You know when it's appropriate to use. You understand the dynamics of a group. Within that group, you are going to do a process of investigation. So now you've done an email, let's say, they, they are interested in it, they've seen all your content that Susan taught you about, 
an email that Susan talked about or any one of these uh, referral campaigns. There's lots of ways they might have come into you. We are going to teach, I'm going to go through one method. There are many sales methods. There are, I have a stack of books on my desk, maybe 20 of them. Lots of them are valid. I'm picking one for today called Spin uh, by a guy named Neil Rackham. Uh, mostly because it's a very easy thing for me to walk you through. And then from there, you can choose other methods if you choose. Okay? By the way, you can buy his book as well if you want. Um, it'll be a more detailed thing that I'm covering today. The basic premise of spin works this way. Um, I'll, I'll pose a question to you. How many people think sales, a successful salesperson looks like the guys from Wolves of Wall Street? How many people? Raise your hand. OK, one. All right. How many people think they look like used car salesmen from the movies? Right. What do these guys look like? The first premise of spin is that they're not salesmen at all. What a successful salesman is like is someone who spends the time to understand the customer's problems and issues, understands what they're looking for and their risks, and poses a solution that makes their lives better. Your software or other things get sold along with it, but you're solving a problem. You're helping them advance. You're mitigating a risk, something where they feel good that this is something they want. This methodology, also referred to as consultative selling, is highly effective for larger, especially ongoing projects, and especially for add-on revenue later. What you see in the aggressive salesman is usually a single transaction that you don't revisit. You're not going to see that person again. right? Somewhere where there's lots of misinformation and other things like that, and where the buyer is uninformed. You don't know as much about the car as the seller does. Those are not true in this case. Your buyers are well informed. In some cases, they're experts. Doing that method will not work. If you are pushing in a sale, you have already failed. Most of the time when I do deals, they are asking for the deal because they understand how valuable it is to them. Spin selling is a method for achieving it to the point where the customer demands the product or is interested in the product. You're not selling it to them, they're asking for it. That also helps your pricing, it helps reduce discounts, and many other things. So let's walk through this in a series of steps. Remember, you're consulting. The first thing you're going to cover is situation. These are very light, light questions. What kind of machines do you have? What are you doing now? I want two notes on this. Please do not ask a question you could Google. This annoys the piss out of people. You have a certain amount of goodwill on that phone. You ask a dumb question, you've used up a big chunk of it. Don't burn your goodwill. Ask intelligent questions. If you are well-versed, this is really helpful. If you are enough well-versed that the buyer feels you are in their field, you get a lot more points. You get a lot more credibility. You can ask better questions. And they will answer more questions. But you can ask a few basic questions up front. You know, what do you use now? Things like that. These are called situation questions. Okay? They're not really aggressive. They're not anything big. They're just sort of introductory to make sure you know what's going on. Okay? In a few minutes, you guys are going to pair up, by the way. I'm going to give you a heads up on this. You're going to pair up, and you're all going to walk through this process together. You're going to ask a situation question and a few others. I'm giving you a heads up now, mostly because I want to make sure you're paying attention. Uh, and we'll do this in a few minutes. All right? But that's a situation question. What are you doing now? How are you doing it now? The next set of questions. So now you've asked a few of these questions. Oh, you do it this way. You say, oh, you have a problem with that. Do you stay late because of it? Is that painful to solve? Have you ever had a major breach? Does that cost you a lot of money? These are called problems. You now know a little bit about the situation. You can now get them to talk about their problems. Here's an interesting question for you. How many people like to complain about their problems? Raise your hand if you like to complain about your problems. Really? Come on, anybody who didn't put your hand up, really? Everybody likes to. If, you, if they feel comfortable and you have exceeded their trust level, they have to trust you a little bit, they don't feel you're selling them something, you have to exceed that trust level, they will complain and complain and complain. It's surprising. There is a small group of people who do not complain. There are a few, but they're fairly rare. 
Usually the people who aren't complaining are because they don't trust you. If you've exceeded the trust, most people will complain. Yeah, it's late, it's horrible. This guy has a funny looking beard. Oh, I have to work with this guy. You had a question before I insult you. I have a question. Uh, more comment. I think people can complain a lot when it doesn't mean that they made a mistake before. For example, they choose uh, a solution and it doesn't work. Uh, if you ask them directly, uh, OK, what's your problem with this? Usually they don't say it because that's so, never made a mistake before. We're going to talk about this when we do the drills together. Pointed questions are very hard until you've gotten deeper into it. So most of my questions do not, do not go that targeted. So a problem question might be, because, because I know you've told me what software you're using. So remember you asked situation, right? I know, he's using, I know he's using Salesforce. I know the problems with Salesforce. You better know the problems with your competitor's product, right? I know Salesforce. I said, wow, yeah, I know a lot of your, a lot of your other companies in your position, they hate that pricing. Yeah, so do we. I better know what the problem is to draw him to. A good salesperson, he knows the weaknesses of the situation answers he got. If they say they're using X, you should darn well know what the problem should look like. What I'm not going to say to him is, wow, how much did you pay for that last month? All right? This breaches trust. You've gone too far with it. This is very much like dating. It's a little bit of a play, you know, you got to play it along slowly here. You can't just leap right in. Well, at least I can't, anyway. Maybe you can. Maybe if I was better looking. I don't know. Okay. I'm going to hold most of the rest until I get through it, but we'll come back to those. So, some basic situations. You're going to ask them basic problems. You should know what some of those problems look like. These problems can go on for a little while. In longer processes, problems may be several calls. But the, the idea is to get them. Please keep note of the problems listed. Do not lose track of this. I can't tell you how many salespeople I know. They get off the call and I say, okay, what were some of the problems? They go, oh, I don't remember now. <laughs> no, dude, this is how you sell. You have to know what those problems look like. So now they've told you a bunch of their problems. They've whined and complained to you. Please do not say, oh, we solved that. Oh, oh, ugh, instantly. You know what happens when you say that? Anybody want to guess why you don't say that? Guys, me crazy. Come on, nobody wants to guess? We don't show them up. You immediately just tried to leap to close. They know you're trying to sell them. Yeah. Their trust is lost. To get people to complain and tell you what's going on, they cannot feel like you're selling to them. Don't leap past it. All right, so now we've guided them along. They've told us a little bit of their problems. What are we going to do next? You need to do the next step, and this is one of the hardest steps. You need to move them from problem to issue. So I'm going to define the difference. The problem is it's a slow system. The issue is it delays me from getting home. What's the impact of that problem? Makes me late getting home to my cat who pees all over my carpet. Right? Uh, it pisses off my boss because I make too many errors. It cost us a million dollars because we lost a client last month because of it. You want to know what this is. What is the implication? I'm going to pose this statement to you. Most people do get the problem. Better people get to implication. Here's why. A problem is like a feature. It requires the user to understand how valuable it is before they're willing to pay for it to be solved. That's a problem. An implication, it is obvious to everybody in the room. Everybody in that company knows the value of that statement. They require no expertise to do it. That means when they're in a conference call, when that group is debating it, when they're having the conversation, everybody in that room knows it's, knows it's, it's got value. Everybody knows its value because it's obvious. We lost a million dollar customer last month. Everybody knows that value. It runs two seconds faster. They have no idea what that means. Classic example of this, of course, is you know like gigahertz on a processor. Do you know the difference between a 2.4 and a 2.6? No. But if I say you get your email faster or whatever, that you get. Problem, issue. Okay? Move them to issue. What does that mean? Okay? So now they start telling you what the issue is. Yeah, it's going to be a pain. My boss is going to yell at me. We lost a customer. So now we're going to move to the last phase. Remember, we're still in the investigation phase. The last part of the investigation phase, the N in spin, need. This oftentimes, up until now, you've made them feel like crap, right? They're complaining, things are terrible, things are slow, they might lose their job if this goes wrong. If we get hacked, this is expensive. Need to move them to the other side now. Now it's positive. 
What if that went away? What if we solve that for you? How might your life be better? Would your boss give you a promotion for that? This is oftentimes referred to as future perfect. You want them to imagine the better future and what comes from it. It's often also called payoff, need slash payoff. This is important because they, once they start saying this stuff, they are imagining your solution already. They're already halfway to buying your product. If they can imagine how much better their life is, they already know why they want to buy your product. They become the salesman. So they start telling you, oh yeah, if we had that, I'd be easier at home, easy, my boss would yell at me, all these sorts of things. And also I'm gonna give you two important notes. If you're good at what you do and you know your product, you should know what problems you solve. Please do not pose a solution that you can't do. This is gonna hurt you in a minute as you try to actually get to closure. Um, your, the idea here is you know your product enough to guide them to the solution you can achieve for them. So it's clear what they're gonna get. I'm gonna point out something. There are two sides to this coin, the person and the company. The person has to have a benefit and the company has to have a benefit. If you fail to address either one of those, it's much tougher. Okay? So you need to make them imagine how that solution might be better, how it benefits them, how it benefits their boss, how it benefits the company. What I'm actually doing at this point, at this point, that person has now become your internal sales guy. He knows what's gonna happen, right? He's got all this information. All you gotta do is give him a bunch of bullets, you know, some marketing material and a little bit of support, and he can be very helpful to you. The other thing about it is, within an organization, he's an insider. He's intrinsically more trusted than you. So if he walks into a meeting and says, we can make an extra million dollars from this, it is completely different than if you walk into the meeting and say that. All right? When he imagines the future perfect, if he imagines it, that it's very positive, he's automatically gonna start doing this. Especially if you give him, yeah, wouldn't it be great? What would happen to your career if you did this really successful project? Future perfect. All right, I'm gonna step back for a minute. We're talking about enterprise sales. We start talking a little about how to make sure it's a group, when to use this. There's a four-step process in the, in the uh, investigation phase. Situation, problem, issue, need, and payoff. At the point where you now have this, you have all the information you need to move to the last phase. At this point, you actually demonstrate your product. Anybody want to know, why did we wait until we had all that before we demonstrated? Anybody want to take a guess? They're more willing to, to listen. Okay, more willing to listen? Your product is a potential solution they already laid out for themselves. They've already told you what you got to show. I know exactly. I don't have to show my product. I'm not showing my product. I'm showing the solution to the problem they stated. I'm showing them that how that need is going to be met. The purpose of the demonstration is not to show your product. I cannot tell you how many times I've gotten halfway through a demonstration before people even realize they're talking about the product I'm selling them. All they care about is that it solves that problem they have, that it meets their need. You address their needs. To do this, sometimes you do have to show some product stuff around it, but my point is, your language, what you say, is meeting needs, not product and feature. So if they say that the single most important thing about this is that it's green, because the CEO loves the color green, you better be talking about the fact that the screens are green. Because that's what's valuable to them. Doesn't, in some ways, it doesn't matter if it's dumb to you as long as they're willing to buy it for that feature, okay. But mostly, you have all kinds of ammunition. So a few minutes ago, they complained to you that they lost a million dollar client. When you get to the screen, you show them, they say, see, hear this? You won't lose that million dollar client now. They have associated the, the payoff right to your product. So at the point where they call you back and start negotiating price, what are you gonna say? Well, I'm gonna save you a million dollars a quarter. We're talking about 10,000. This is all the leverage you need when you get to negotiations, which is going to be the next step, commitment. At this point, most people get to the end of the sales process, they are on the back end of some purchasing guy beating them up for price, because they got nothing to offer. Purchasing guy calls you and you say, I know you're gonna save a million dollars next month. Ugh. Awfully hard to negotiate. I mean, you've literally got all your ammunition. You've got your insiders who have given you all the information because they were trying to solve a problem, not being sold to. Negotiations change quite a bit at this point. 
gets very difficult for them to beat you down because you literally are holding the stick over their head because you know exactly what they're getting from this. And you know how valuable it is. It doesn't mean you don't give it all. Back to the group dynamics, the purchasing guy always wants a pound of flesh, so you're going to give him a little something, make him happy, but you have a much better position to negotiate from. Make sense? So commitment is mostly about herding everybody together, providing materials and a few other things. Believe it or not, there's closings in most of my deals are tiny. Sometimes as little as 20 or 30 minutes. They're very, very short, even for large deals, because everything's in place already. They've already decided they're going to buy it. It's just a matter of signing documents. Be aware, every now and then, budgets do pop into this end. They get all the way through, they want to buy it, but they don't have a budget. Okay. We're going to talk about this when we go a little bit offline. One of the little preliminary things you're going to evaluate under the problem and everything is whether or not they have a budget, right? Do they have budgets, do they have a team? That's part of your initial situation, situation questions. People who don't have budgets, you got to figure out whether or not you're going to be able to get done with it. If you're selling a million dollar product and the company's revenues are like 20 million and they don't have a budget for you, good luck. Wouldn't that be something that you'd probably want to get out in the open during the investigation? Yeah, that's up in when I said the situation questions. Oftentimes it lands around between situation and problem question. Most people will tell you that when you start the conversation about the problem, all right? We're navigating around a credit card company, one of the world's largest, right? And all of this I'm not going to cover specifics just yet. We're going to wait until we do partners, and then we'll get back to it. At the negotiation phase, IT get around the table. And then they bring in the whole, there's other ways to do this. Yes, of course. Which means That's you didn't bring them in in the group to begin with. Right. OK. Yeah. It, so I want to make mention of something. Um, this is easy for me to stand here. Let, let's face it. Being on the phone and actually doing this stuff, it's hard. I made calls many years. I failed ignominiously. I was absolutely terrible. I learned. I got better. No matter how much it is, it is so much harder to actually execute this than to talk about it. Things go wrong. People call. You didn't realize IT. You forgot to ask the budget question. This is never going to work the way I just presented it. It doesn't happen. But if you have the basic structure, you can work within the structure best you can. Having someone come into the group at, when you're trying to close is unlikely to, is unlikely to close. It won't work very much. Does that make sense? Um, real quick, and then, then I'm going to go to the next part. What are your thoughts on people who go over budget? On people who go over budget, meaning I'm going to make sure I've understood the question. They say to you, I don't have budget, but let's keep talking. People go budget all over. People do go over budget. Yeah, so all the time. So when you know that you can like going over budgets possible versus going over budgets not possible. So there's the there's the rule of thumb goes something like this: many things appear or can be magically created in the budget. Usually, budget is used as an excuse to say I, I'm not going to go forward with you. If you have uncovered the problems before, you know what their what their solution is. You normally get a feel for the budget question at that point if it's real or not. So I want to start with that. The most, most of the time when people say budget to me, what they're really saying is I did a shitty job of explaining the benefits. That's my most common. The second one is, because the thing is, if they really didn't have the budget, why would they spend the time on the phone with you? I'm going to give an exception, uh, government employees. Government employees will spend six months talking to you with no budget. <laughs> because they got nothing else to do. <laughs> I, I wanted to make that one exception. In rare cases, most people's jobs require them to get things done. So if they really don't have a budget, really, really don't, they're probably not going to talk to you very much. It generally will come up early in the conversation. Most of the time when it comes up at the end, it's because they don't have a clear benefit. So yes, we go over budget all the time. You have to judge it from the situation. Okay. I'm going to cover just one more. Actually, I'm going to hold that question off because I, I want to actually move to the second part. Honestly, me standing here talking is really just not that interesting, um, not even to me. Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do an exercise. I want you to find someone from another company. Is that a hard question? Go ahead. Very, very quick. In the beginning, you told that there is a reason that they start thinking that we they can't cook by our software if our software is a particular part of the thing. How is that? Okay, let, let's see what that after. So I'm going to pause. I want you to find someone from another. Let's get back to it. I want you to find someone from another company. We're going to go through this exercise together. Here's your assignment. You're going to walk through this process as if you've just called them. 
please assume that they've at least gotten a small piece of information, they've replied to an email. If it's a totally cold call, it's, it gets, it's a little bit hard to actually get it going. So let's assume you've sent them an email, they've replied back saying they want to talk to you about it. We are going to compress this whole thing into a few, you know, like five, ten minutes at most. So yes, it's going to be compressed. People who are acting as the people being pitched, two things. Don't be a total pain in the ass. Right. It's an exercise. I don't know why it becomes like a competition, especially with sales guys. They want to beat the other guy. You're trying to help them learn. Let them, let them give them a little bit. It's an exercise, OK? All right. Secondly, the people doing it, don't get too wound up in every detail. Just try it out for a little bit. Just You're playing around. Nobody does a great job the first five or 10 times you do this. Don't worry about it. Just play around with it. All right. I want you to pair up, find a little bit of space. Make sure they're not from your company. And I'm gonna, in about five minutes, I'm gonna call you all back, all right? Go, go find someone. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm gonna pause now. Okay, stop selling. I know, it's so good. I'm glad you guys are all really excited, obviously. I, I'd like you all now to pause for a moment and share with the group things you learned along the way, things that either went well or went terribly, terribly wrong. I'm gonna open it up. I found that the transition going from understanding the mm -hmm. problem and the even envisioning the better future, transitioning then into the product, I thought that was kind of a leap. That was Got it. So from product product to need is a leap. Usually there, there's issue between. So let's try a sentence that might do that. So let's assume uh, he's complaining, give me, what was the topic? What were you guys working on? What was the problem stated? Oh, uh, so the problem was for us was engaging millennials. Engaging millennials. Yeah. I said, okay, wow, you guys have a hard time. I know a lot of other companies have a hard time engaging millennials. What do you think might, we might be able to do with that? Wouldn't it be cool if you had a tool that did? So transitioning oftentimes. Actually, I was more, there was the transition from, if you had a tool that did this, would that be better? They said, absolutely, yes. It's the transition from then to, that's what I do. That, okay, that's okay, the, that's what I do. So here's the good news. They, they sort of know you're on the phone for a reason, so it's not too bad. But let's assume for the moment I say, yes, we actually, so here's an example. Oh, would, you, would it be really helpful if you could engage millennials better? Yeah, we're definitely looking for that. Okay, we might be able to help you with that. You notice I said the word we, right? This is a, this is a consult. We might be able to help you with that. I didn't say I'm selling you something. And I say, well, let's see what else you have here and let's see what else we might be able to help you with. Yep. We were talking, and I was doing the problem thing, like you emailed yesterday, so now right. we're speaking. Right. But you got me into a features kind of loop, like how yep. is your product compared to yep. such and such. Oftentimes, sales especially, it's hard because we want to talk. People like me especially, I have a big mouth, I really like hearing myself talk. <laughs> we tend to talk. Better salespeople, 70% listening. Opening small questions and guiding questions. So. The habit you need to get into is, is, is to simply let them do more talking, not trying to force the issue too much. Also, along those lines, accept the fact that some of these calls won't work. It just, it just doesn't work every time. Don't expect it to. So an example, when I come onto a call, a lot of times I say, what would you like to accomplish from this call? Why am I saying that? Because they're going to tell me their key goals, what they're there for. Some people start off calls with, is this a good time to talk? And that's actually another good expression because what that does is gives you permission to continue the conversation. If they say, no, 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 I'm busy, you can schedule another time. But if they say it's okay, mentally they've now accepted the fact that you will be taking some of their time. They've given you permission. Does that make sense? Either one of those are good, but you be careful avoiding, because a lot of times people say, okay, well, what are you selling? This gets, it happens to me all the time. What are you selling and how much does it cost? It's very common. I say, oh, we sell a lot of stuff, but let me ask a few quick questions so I know which product to talk about. So do you have a problem with millennials? I've guided you back to an open question. Make sense? Pricing is one of the early ones. Almost everyone will bring up pricing very early. And a lot of times my answer is, I'm happy to, to go over it, but if, if, we, if you answer a few more questions, I can tell you which price is right. I don't want to barrage you with a bunch of numbers you don't care about. And a lot of times I'll get questions. If someone asks a direct question twice, so I say, how much does it cost? And I say, well, let me ask you a few more questions and I can give you the right price. And they say, no, no, just tell me how much it is. The second time you just answer the question flat out. Don't, don't bother, because you actually pass something called the annoyance level, right? Once you annoy someone, you, you don't get anywhere. So you say, it's, it's $14.95, but per user, depending upon this. 
but it does depend on how you want to use it. So what are you looking to solve with this? And then I can just reroute it back. Okay. How about it? somebody else? Interesting things you learned or got from this discussion? Yeah. Um, I actually learned that uh, when he was selling me his product, mm -hmm. as an employee, I learned that his product solves it so well that it substitutes my job. And at the moment, I, I was like, oh, shit. Job <laughs> substitution. <laughs> if you buy this, it's going to be awesome, but I'll be fired. I yes. So I'm going to be specific, because this is actually very common in the software world. Um, and it is problematic, because you're going to bump into these people, and they're going to see it as a threat. Generally speaking, that means you should be talking to the next guy up, right? not this guy, because it's going to be a little hard to sell. But in the, in the world of group selling, it's going to happen. So let me say how I address that. I said, some, so let's assume for the moment you're a data, a data entry clerk. And I'm selling a solution that removes the need for a data entry clerk. Yeah. And I say, oh, do you ever really want to do something else in your company? <laughs> I mean, this is a great opportunity. This is a great, I mean, he knows if the point where, he's, where he knows he's going to be fired, he's like, yeah, this sort of replaces my job. You say, well, you know, we can probably work with your boss and see if there's other really cool opportunities. You mentioned you like, remember, if you've talked to this person for a little bit, you've got some clue what's going on. So you're still trying to solve the problem for this person as well. You're going to try to help solve their problem. At the point where you're an ally in this, they might figure, well, I'm going to get replaced anyway. But I will tell you, if you get caught in that conversation, it is never good. Like, like getting into that, that's, that's not something you want. But if, if you get that right in your face, if it literally says, well, this replaces me, that's the best way to get back out of it. But that's not a desirable location for the conversation. <laughs> Make sense? We got, we got, I'll just give you a quick time check. It is 3.50. I have been taking 50 minutes of your time. We're just going to do two more quick things. And then I need to clear the stage for, for Tam here. Two more quick observations. Yeah. But observation was actually a question, can I help you? Uh, I'd like to do observations for a moment, okay. and then let's come back. Any other things you learned or got from the session? Yeah. Uh, I'd rather have a different person, because we had one already, but nobody else? OK, how about that one? Uh, the investigation part was pretty key, because I actually didn't really know what Alfred had worked on previously. So I was like, OK, before I start on my pitch, i got to actually figure out what your product is to start. Yep. So just like getting that solid understanding. Yeah. It's amazing to me how many people come to me and pitch a features that are completely irrelevant to me all the time. You don't know what's valuable until the person tells you it is. Don't assume you know. Things are different in every company, different priorities, different budget cycles. Don't assume. When you ask the question, you find out what's really valuable. That's what you're selling against. Not what you do, but what's valuable to them. Uh, yeah, one more back here. Getting to the issue. Uh, blue shirt. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll get you. Let's see here. So, for spin selling, um, like you're, you're definitely right. I, I've like, read the book and I've tried it somewhat in the past, and uh, in theory, it works really well. But um, like, it's been tough to kind of adopt yep. uh, in my sales process. So, are there like any resources you could provide, like like, uh, or do you recommend like videos or like more extensive like, uh, um, material? <coughs> There's a whole website, I mean, there's got to be a dozen websites and books. So I will offer you a slightly different insight, though. The biggest problem that I see most of my team in adopting SPIN is it's very counterintuitive because they're salespeople, because they want to talk. Um, and most of the time, it's a matter of practice. And it's painful. It's long. It's not an hour or two. It's not even, it's, a, it's, it's like 50 to 100 hours of being fairly pushing yourself. And the last thing you need is to accept the failures. The first two weeks you're going to use it are going to be shit. It's going to be shit. Deals are not going to go well. Accept that that's, you, that's the price you pay for the skill development. Because when you start to hedge it and then you start to flip back and forth, you actually build bad habits. A good salesperson who has practiced does not even think about the next question. It's, they, they hear the inbound stream. They know exactly how to form the next question to guide. You cannot build that skill set unless you're practicing it again and again. When I say you've got to mess things up to learn, it's just a part of that process. So start with some low value calls, <laughs> low value ones. But I think try it a bit more. And lastly, do not be absolutely rigorous. I can't uh, want to do this last note. The, the world does not work where you go situation, problem, issue. It, never, it always moves around. It's always chaotic, except a little bit of chaos. Sometimes it's not going to work exactly. Don't worry about it. The idea is not to be rigorous. It's to, be, it's to stick with the idea of asking the questions and guiding them. That's the most important part. 
you're never, I've never done it exactly like that. Uh, one more quick one, and then, then we gotta move on. Have you ever seen this employed, like if you foster a relationship with somebody mm -hmm. and you have it employed this at the beginning to bring it in towards the end, or, or even when they sure. bring in more group? Sure, to, to I've taken things. people out and I get about two or three drinks in and that works great. Okay. Um, and that's not, that's, I'm actually not being humorous, that's actually a serious statement. In long-term relationships, you'll go out over beers, people have an expectation to be more casual, and you'll figure out what the real problems and real issues are. Um, we have one more minute. All right. They like they like to joke within big companies that no one's gonna get fired for hiring, let's say, picking IBM. IBM. Right. Yeah. That's so if I'm a startup, how do I go around that so that they will accept? Okay. It? So there's there's gain. <coughs> yes, but would you like to get promoted? Right. There's gain, personal gain. There's company gain. Your competitors are coming after you. You're losing margin. <laughs> Right? There's about, remember all those hooks from the emails we talked about, the email list from Susan? That's the exact same list. Fear, Fear competition, yeah. personal gain, competitive gain, political gain upon somebody else in the company, uh, return on investment, although that's, that's the math, that's not the emotion. Right? A lot of times people don't buy because it really advances so much as it prevents something bad from happening. Okay. We're out of time. I hope you guys found this useful. Uh, let's go ahead and close it up and give you a five minute break before Tammy gets up to continue. All right? Thanks so much for your time.